How do you achieve disaster recovery for Kubernetes cluster? Let's take a look at a typical Kubernetes cluster setup. Your EKS cluster will be running inside a VPC, and this VPC will use few availability zones. You will run worker nodes or EC2s in these availability zones, and inside these EC2s, your application will be running inside pods. Now, you need to have some sort of way to route traffic to these pods, so you will use ingress. You will also use some sort of database running in private subnet. This architecture will be running inside a region, let's say region 1. Out of the box, the load balancer, EKS cluster, they are all regional service and they will span multiple availability zone. So even if one availability zone goes down, your application will still be up and running. However, if this whole region, region 1, goes down, your application will be down. To avoid that, you need to have the same architecture running in another region. So you need to spin up another EKS cluster and you need to have some sort of way to get the data in the database running in that region. More on that later. But remember, I said application load balancer and EKS cluster, they're all regional services. One EKS cluster or one load balancer cannot span across multiple regions. So now you have two load balancers and two EKS clusters. So you have to have some sort of mechanism to route traffic from one region to another in case of a failover. How do you do that? You can use Amazon Route 53, which is the DNS service. In Amazon Route 53, you have to specify a routing policy and you can use failover. So Route 53 using DNS can sense that region one is down and it will start sending traffic to region two. Remember that in this routing policy, the traffic will not be split into these two regions when both regions are up and running. It will only switch over in case one region fails. You can also split traffic between these two regions, but that complicates thing and generally in real world enterprises, you will fail over only when one region is down. Now, Route 53 is great, but in case your application or the client caches the DNS result, there will be in a delay to switch over to region two. To avoid that, use a new AWS service called AWS Global Accelerator. Global Accelerator is a networking service that sends your users traffic through AWS's global network infrastructure, improving the internet user performance by up to 60%, Instead of relying on DNS for routing traffic at a global level, Global Accelerator can switch traffic routes without requiring DNS changes or delays caused by DNS propagation and client-side caching. Now, when you configure a AWS Global Accelerator, you can choose these two different load balancer as the two different endpoints, and you could also select the similar routing policy like failover. You will specify 100% traffic for region one, 0% in region two, and only when region one goes down, the whole 100% of traffic will switch to region two. And when you configure AWS Global Accelerator, it will give you a out of the box DNS URL. You will still want to use Amazon Route 53 if you want to map a nice custom domain to your application. And that can point to that AWS Global Accelerator URL. Okay, so this takes care of the networking disaster recovery, but what about the database? Since now you are running the database in two regions, you have to have some sort of database replication. Now this will change based on database to database. If you are using Amazon Aurora, you can use global table, which will do the replication out of the box for you. If you are using RDS, you can have a primary RDS instance and then you can use read replica across multiple regions. Now, in case the region one goes down, you need to have some sort of mechanism to create the primary instance in this region too. The primary instance can do both read and write. So obviously when region one goes down, you cannot write into the database using the primary in region one. So you have to promote one of the read replicas to a primary instance. Now there are multiple ways to do that. I'm not gonna go too deep on it because that is more on the database disaster recovery side, but study up on that before your interview. So how about DevOps? 
Let's say you are using Jenkins to deploy the application into this region one. How does this happen? How does Jenkins know which Kubernetes cluster to deploy the code into? This happens using a file called kubeconfig, which specifies which cluster the Jenkins job should deploy the applications to. In case of disaster recovery, you can switch this kubeconfig to point to region two cluster. You can go fancy with it. You can have a root 53 controller, which does constants health checks. And if the health checks fail, you can go switch the Jenkins job to point to another kubeconfig or run some kubeconfig command to point to the EKS cluster running in region two. Now there's a couple other things to keep in mind. Let's say region one is up and running and a lot of traffic is coming in. So the pods are scaled beyond its initial replicas. Region two will only be running the initial replica. So it will take some time for the pods to scale up as the traffic starts to shift again. So there could be a little bit of latency. And if we tie this whole disaster recovery to one of the disaster recovery strategies for AWS, this falls in the warm standby category because backup and restore assumes that you will have no cluster running, you will have to bring up another cluster, another database, etc., from scratch. Then there is a pilot light with which the database will be replicated, but the EKS cluster will not be running in another region. In our case, it is warm standby, standby because our EKS cluster is always running in the other region, but smaller, and you scale AWS resources after event. What if you need to achieve multi-site active active? So the difference between warm standby and multi-site active active is with warm standby, you scale the AWS resources after the event. After the switchover, as the traffic goes up to the second region, your pods will scale. But multi-site active actives, the pods should already be scaled up even before the traffic switches. So the cost will definitely be higher. And how can you achieve that? Well, you can do that if you are using cluster autoscaler with autoscaling group, you can constantly change the desired number of EC2 count for region two preemptively. So multiple EC2s are already up and running. As soon as the traffic shifts, the new pods will come up faster. Another way to handle it is using cluster over provisioner. With cluster over provisioner, multiple EC2 worker nodes will be up and running with pause pods. And as soon as the traffic shifts, your, the pause pods will be replaced by your application pods pretty quickly. So in summary, for Kubernetes disaster recovery, think of each component and how to replicate them, such as networking, database, other storage. We didn't talk about uh, stateful workloads. So if you are using stateful workloads, you need to use some sort of tool like Velero to replicate those persistent volumes. If you are using S3 buckets, you need to replicate them in another region, etc. How about code deployment? We talked about it using Jenkins. You can also do that using GitOps. Can you guys and girls tell me how can you achieve this code deployment automatically in different region using GitOps? Tie it back to the disaster recovery strategy. Our strategy that we discussed is warm standby. Think about what you need to do if you need to fail back to pilot light or multi-site active active. Also keep in mind multi-AZ versus multi-region. If your application is not critical and multi-AZ is okay, all you need to do is ensure that your application is running in multiple availability zone across your region. All right, folks, let me know what you think of this video. If you like this video, if you found this video helpful, please click that like button, smash it if that's something you are into and subscribe. I'll see you guys and girls in the next video. Bye.